Hey everyone, my name is Kelsey Woody. I'm the event and meeting manager for the National Indian Health Board. Um, I don't I don't know if you guys are joining us for if this is your first session of the day or if you are joining us and this is your second session of the day. Um, there are, I believe, four different time slots for the behavioral health learning event today. Um, but I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items and also introduce our presenter. Um, so I do want to let you all know that this session, this presentation is being recorded um, and that the presentation for this presentation is 90 minutes long and that uh, if you are seeking CE credits, continuing education units, um, that at the very end of this presentation, you click the little sign out link that was provided to you in your in the email that you used to log on. Uh, that part is very important. You, we can't process those CE credits without you clicking that sign out link, filling out the information there. Um, I'll put it in the chat box for you, so that way you can do that. I'll put it in the chat box at the end and remind you as well, um, but you can also find it in the invitation email. Um, you're all muted, and if, if you can please keep yourself muted so that way we can put the, kind of reduce the background noise for our presenter, that would be very much appreciated. And at the end, um, she's going to allow some time for question and answer. And if you prefer to kind of just speak your question, uh, you can do that as well at the end. Um, yeah, uh, I, you guys are probably done hearing me talk, but I want to introduce uh, Deidre Yellow Hair Gay. And the, her presentation is on the emotional well being for American Indian Alaska Natives during the COVID 19 crisis. It's all yours, Deidre. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kelsey. Um, good. It, it is morning where I'm at. So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good day. Thank you for joining us today for today's presentation on emotional well-being for American Indians, Alaska Natives um, during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, like Kelsey said, my name is um, oops. my name is Dr. Deidre Yellowhair Begay. I, um, I'll introduce myself in my language. Um, good morning, good day, everyone. Oops, I am so sorry. Um, again, good morning, everyone. It is so nice to be with you all today. Um, before we start and get right into the main presentation, I do like to start with some disclosures. I think it's really important sometimes to discuss how we are, um, where we are positioned in the scholarship work that we're doing, because I think as indigenous uh, scholars, we're not always removed completely from the work that we do. We're, we're related to it in some way. It's important to us in some way. So these are my disclosures. I come to you today on today's topic as a Diné Estene or um, a Navajo woman. I use the pronouns she, her, hers. I am a mother. Um, so during this whole pandemic, I have been a parent and have struggled through all the um, schooling at home while working full time types of things. Um, I am a minority woman in academe, um, and that's a that's a space that I've carved out um, in working at a university, um, going through a PhD program. Um, recognizing that that elevates me to a certain position of privilege. Um, I, so skipping down a little bit, I do recognize that with that, um, throughout this pandemic, I've had access to resources that many, you know, tribal community members in my own tribe and those that surround where I live currently, clients that I've worked with have not had access to the same resources. Um, and, and I've grappled with that throughout the pandemic. Um, my family and the tribal communities that I'm from and that I work for have all been hit hard by COVID-19 and have all been impacted and we're still uh, processing some of those, um, the ways that the pandemic and COVID-19 has impacted our communities. Um, I also come to you today with this awareness of how academic spaces, systems of education have added to the historical trauma of my ancestors, my grandparents, um, and the generation of my parents, and how 
some of that, um, some of those historical traumas have been triggered recently with some of the news and the media coverage of um, residential schools in Canada and in North in in, in the United States. Um, I also like to include a land acknowledgement because the land that some of our academic spaces, our workspaces exist on, are traditional and cultural. Um, homelands to indigenous people that were here before us. So here at the University of New Mexico, the university sits on land that is tr the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. Um, and in New Mexico in general, it's home to Pueblo, Navajo and Apache tribes. And I like to just take the time to acknowledge that, um, you know, um, the erasure of indigenous people happens. So wherever you are in your space, um, take some time to learn about who are the original inhabitants of that land and acknowledge their presence, acknowledge their contributions to where you are in your workspace, in your school space, in your, you know, the spaces that you occupy. Um, so today's presentation, the goal of today's presentation is that by the end of this, each of the learners will be able to identify how the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic triggers um, trauma responses in AIA and communities, identify how AIA and communities experience layers of trauma, including microaggressions associated with the ongoing pandemic, um, identify and practice responses to clients who report symptoms of trauma, um, trauma responses or experience microaggressions. Um, learners will also be able to leave the session with examples of culturally informed responses to providing tele telehealth, mental health care and wellness to communities. Um, and again, we'll have time at the end for questions. Um, so if you could just please hold your questions to the end, or type them in the chat box. Um, we'll have some time to answer those towards the end. Um, as many of you know, COVID-19 had a huge impact worldwide, but it had a particular impact on tribal communities. You know, as the COVID-19 um, rates climbed nationwide, the responses um, increased with intensity and, um, and it hit our tribal communities fairly quickly. I know here in New Mexico, um, things happened rather quickly. Um, it, it took a weekend and things were shut down fairly quick. Um, and it, it forced our community into restrictions. So there were, there were large impact in restrictions on family gatherings, visiting neighbors. Um, there were restrictions on practicing traditional and ceremonial practices. Um, and as people, as communities started to lose members of the community to COVID-19, the practices of traditional grief, the traditional grieving practices and mourning practices were restricted. Um, and it really left many of our communities disconnected from, from, um, from each other because we weren't able to gather like we are, like we were, used to gathering. Um, there, many families were left mourning elders and traditional knowledge keepers. Um, the feelings of stress and stress response increased all across our tribal communities. Um, and our communities had a greater impact because a lot of our risk factors as American Indian communities are much greater due to things like historical trauma um, the, the presence of um, intergenerational trauma. Um, many of our um, community members have difficult living situations or unstable housing that added stress, um, a new layer of stress. There's pre existing economic instability for some families. Um, some families have pre existing medical conditions, the presence of substance abuse, poor relationships. Um, Poor peer relationships, so you know, smaller circles of support, um, and then there presented the learning challenges for younger kids in tribal communities. That those learning challenges highlighted, I think, infrastructure and technology, for technology and access to technology all across 
the nation for tribal communities because kids in in a week in in several days went from learning in person face to face to learning in virtual schools some kids didn't have access to a laptop or a single computer in the home or there was a single computer and five kids who all needed to log into their various different classes at the same time um, it presented problems that, you know, in some deep parts of the reservation or not even deep parts of the reservation. I know the Pueblo that I work for that's just up the road from Albuquerque, they had infrastructure difficulties. Um, you know, they couldn't, there were some homes that couldn't access um, internet, wireless internet. So, and then very quickly, many people had to learn to adapt to new platforms um, new learning platforms, new work platforms, new ways of seeking for um, medical care, mental health care, behavioral health care. All of these things were impacted in multiple ways. Um, in addition to that, of course, life continued to go on. So, you know, young adults were facing, you know, the young adults, kids, parents. Might be worth in. They were all continuing to face all of the normal daily stressors and this just compounded everything and layered a whole new layer of stress onto everyday living. Um, but I want to take a moment and look at historical trauma. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, who kind of coined the term, who not kind of, she did coined the term historical trauma, um, defines it as the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding from a mass group trauma across generations, including the lifespan. Now, sometimes we hear about historical trauma and it's not taken into its full context in that historical trauma really means everything that has happened generationally up to a second ago, up to a minute ago, uh, you know, everything up to 10 minutes ago impacts your life. Everything that happens up to this very moment has a way of shaping your thought patterns, your behavior, how you see your relationships, how you interact with people. So when we think about historical trauma and, and we talk about historical trauma, I'd like for you to start to think about it in that context. It is everything that happens in your history up until now, um, in historical trauma response, the constellation of features in reaction to mass group trauma, including historical unresolved grief, um, and we provide examples, child of survivors, um, Jew, like the Jewish Holocaust survivors and their descendants, Japanese American internment camp survivors and their descendants, indigenous people of the Americas and their massively traumatized groups, you know, on, on, you know, on a large scale, their linguistic genocide, their cultural genocide, all the things that have happened, all of that has an impact on the way you collectively and individually respond to some, to trauma. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we continue to go on. But when we think about historical trauma, there are many examples across history um, in, in, uh, you know, in the Jewish community, in the Asian American community. But we focus, uh, today we've, we're focusing on the American Indian community. And here are some examples of historical traumas that have occurred in the past. Um, the ones that I really want to highlight are kind of the the, um, the Trail of Tears, the Long Walk, the Pueblo Revolt, or the forced removal of people from land into these camps or, or reservations um, where they were closed off from returning to their traditional homelands. And that becomes significant because um, as we talk about COVID-19 and how the, how the pandemic and the tr closures of tribal lands really had an impact on um, some American Indians who maybe were living in urban areas and couldn't go home. Um, the treatment of American Indians and um, had no, where they had no alternative choice um, to choose between this policy of the government and extermination wards, you know, they became wards of the government, controlled and managed at the government's discretion. Um, smallpox, smallpox infected blankets when they were passed out. <clears throat> 
and it um, you know, created health disparities in a number of communities. The forced removal of boarding schools, a lot of the boarding school trauma is coming back up in the recent news. Um, you're seeing, we are all collectively seeing um, the trauma of residential schools and, and the unresolved grief that communities have over the children in these mass graves. Um, being being found after years and years of not knowing what happened with those children. So these um, these historical events have particular meaning today because some of that unresolved grief, that unresolved trauma, that historical trauma is coming up again and it's creating tra trauma responses in our communities, in the families, in the clients that you may be working with that you might be seen. Um, so how does historical trauma connect to COVID-19? Um, well, historical trauma, well, COVID-19, again, like I said, is bringing up some of those trauma responses. And if you think way back to when the pandemic first started, we, we heard about it in other parts of the world. And then we heard about it coming to the, you know, like the Eastern side of the United States. And um, and so I'm so sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so we heard about it coming to the United States and then, you know, there were things that started to come up. Well, historically, when we think about things that happen in the United States, often what happened to American Indians isn't ever brought up in the right context. For example, when 9 and when when 9-11 happened, it was reported as the largest massacre ever, the largest attack since Pearl Harbor on US soil, the largest attack for people living on this continent without regard for what happened to American Indians in their history and the massacre that they endured. Um, you know, the anthrax scare um, a few, you know, back in, was it the 90s where tribal leaders were asked, where tribal leaders really fought for and asked for vaccinations for American Indians first because they didn't want their already reduced populations to become smaller or to, for American Indians to go unnoticed yet again. Um, so when we heard about COVID-19 coming to the United States, um, we didn't, nobody was really talking about tribal communities. You didn't really hear how tribal communities were being impacted until after um, the Navajo Nation reached, their numbers reached and exceeded those that existed in New York City. So once the numbers reached were bigger than that of you know, the population in New York City, then they said, oh my gosh, what's happening over here? And then we became part of the story. We became part of what's going on in the United States. So, and then there became the stigma. So here in New Mexico, and I know in other parts where there are tribal communities, there was a stigma for testing positive. There was a stigma for being the first family identified in any tribal community to test positive. Um, and it triggered lots of different feelings and emotions um, again, historical trauma responses in across, you know, across tribal communities. And there was this resistance um, as mass vaccinations or as, as they start talk, to talk about vaccinations, there was this resistance because of what has happened historically to American Indian communities. Um, there was this hesitation to engage in or to take the vaccinations. So all of these reenactments of previous traumas were coming up in various ways. First, when ceremonies were discouraged, um, you know, there was the reenactment of that, um, of the past when ceremonies were outlawed and they were restricted from meeting. You know, I remember my grandparents telling stories. I remember even my mom being a little girl and having to witness, you know, her aunts and uncles being discouraged from partaking in traditional ceremonies. Um, so, so these things were, 
were being brought back up in various ways because of the tribal restrictions, because of the social distancing. Um, and, you know, even though we, as a people, American Indians and tribal communities are resilient and they are strong, when you're asked to socially distance and not visit your neighbor or gather for ceremony, gather for family gatherings, when you're so dependent, not dependent, but when you're, when part of your strength and resilience comes from that community, that bonding as a family, it can make you kind of stop in your tracks and remember not too far long ago, there were these restrictions imposed on tribal communities from the government. So multiple layers and multiple layers of triggers were being reenacted throughout the, the pandemic. So while all of that is going on, there's all this other stuff that is happening, the ongoing cumulative trauma of intergenerational parental trauma that's traced back to boarding schools. You know, that stuff is coming up in the news the um, constant trauma exposure right now, like ongoing to death, um, you know, people dying either of natural causes, um, COVID related causes, alcohol related incidents, suicide, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, um, military service. Um, I know there have been some police officers who have passed during COVID-19 during the pandemic. So all of this, other trauma is still happening. Trauma that would otherwise happen outside of the COVID-19 pandemic is continuing. So there's all this cumulative trauma that is kind of getting layered on. In addition to that, there are microaggressions that were happening. Now, Daryl Wing Su defines the microaggression, defines microaggressions as the, um, they, they come in two forms. Microaggressions can first be covert or overt. Covert mean they're concealed, they're in secret, they're kind of small slights that someone tries to sneak into a conversation that make you think like, hmm, did they really say that? Or did that really happen? Um, or they're overt that are just out in the open. The, and those can be things like racial slurs, hate crimes, racist jokes. Um, there's this picture here that illustrates kind of the covert way, a covert microaggressive message that, you know, the, the darker Barbie doll is worth less than the white ideal looking um, blue eyed blonde haired Barbie doll. So microaggressions defined by Gerald Wing Su are brief everyday exchanges that send denigrating messages to, tar to a target group. It can be a target group of people of color, it can be to women, it can be about the LGBTQIA community, or it can be about an individual. So they're messages that are directed towards individuals or to a group of people. Um, they're often subtle in nature. Again, they can sneak in there, they can be nonverbal, they can be verbal, they can be hand gestures, but they're just very subtle. Um, and we'll talk about what that subtle nature of microaggressions can do to a person's emotional well being. Um, they're often automatic and unconscious. There are different types of microaggressions. A microassault can be verbal, nonverbal, or environmental. Um, if we think about um, name calling, avoidant behaviors, or purposeful discriminatory action. So if we think about things like um, urban areas when they, when they um, do like housing, market housing to a certain demographic to keep them kind of on their side of town, um, that's an environmental micro assault. A micro insult, again, verbal, Behave, verbal comments or behaviors that can be rude or insensitive to demean a person's race. Um, these are comments that indicate that a person of color may not be qualified for a position. How did you get this job? Um, I remember being in graduate school and someone saying, uh, when I interviewed for graduate school, someone made the comment, oh, you're a shoe in because you're native. You know, the assumption that I'm not smart enough, that I'm lacking some kind of intelligence and in me to use my race as a means to gain access to higher education. There's a micro invalidation, behaviors or verbal um, comments that 
exclude, negate, or dismiss the psychology, thoughts, feelings, or reality of a person or a target group. Um, asking a person, where are you really from? Or um, my favorite is when people make the assumption that New Mexico is not part of the United States. Um, so these are all examples of how microaggressions can play out and come out, come about. This is just a map of how they kind of break down and the, the different themes, there's types of micro microaggressions and then the themes of each of the microaggressions um, a micro insult can, where someone can dismiss um, your intelligence, rate you as a second class citizen, pathologize your culture, um, patho pathologizing culture. So, um, you know, in traditional, in traditional homes, like um, say in, in some of the Pueblo homes and families that I work with, they're multi-generational homes. And sometimes there are micro insults about adults still living with their elderly parents. And the insult or the microaggression is this, well, they need to get that adult person needs to get their life together and move out of their parents' house without considering that this is the traditional way of living. There is strength and resilience in having a multi-generational home for not just the elder, the elderly folks that are living there, but for the kids that are coming up and being brought up ingrained in that culture. So how have my microaggressions impacted indigenous communities during the COVID-19 pandemic? There's been this existence of this double jeopardy. So we already face microaggressions because of race, because of the assumed- that, we did, Yeah, in conferences. The, the assumed um, intelligence, the, assume, the assumption that we're, we may not be from here, we look different, but layered on top of that was the assumption of a person's health status. So um, there was in the news things like um, a hospital um, requ requiring a, a group of people, a group of Native Americans um, from certain tribes and certain zip codes to be tested for COVID uh, before women could get their babies. So there was this trauma being reenacted of women, women going into birth, having their babies taken away and then having to be screened and tested for COVID before they could see their baby. Um, and there were many examples of how um, there, were, there were conversations of, um, there were examples in the news of how race and health, uh, the assumed health status of individuals were being played out. So there was a governor in, or um, not a governor, a mayor in Arizona who made a comment about um, how hard the Navajo Nation was trying to uh, be proactive against COVID-19. And he said something along the lines of, I wish they were more proactive about substance abuse. So there were these assumptions that were being made and there were these messages that were being told in the media about a community of people based on their health status and their, their race. Um, so how, so microaggressions, because they're so subtle in nature and they happen in everyday conversations, they happen, they can be verbal, nonverbal, they have this catch 22 effect. Microaggressions can really leave a person wondering if an experience really happened and why it happened. So if something, if someone makes that comment, where are you really from? You can, first glance or first thought, it doesn't really seem like an insult or an aggression, right? But as you walk away, you can, you know, you start to feel like would they have asked anyone else? Or sometimes if I'm, I'm in a group of peers who don't exactly look like me, and I'm the only one who's asked a question, I often wonder, is that because I look different? Um, is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I'm a minority woman in an academic setting? Um, so they, they can, they leave you with this dilemma to confront the event or not. 
it can create this clash of realities, you know what it isn't happening, that's probably not what they meant to do. Um, and you give them, you give people the benefit of the doubt because you want to believe the best in people. Um, the perceived minimal harm of racial microaggressions can really cause a lot of impact. So if a person, um, if a client comes in and says, I think I experienced a microaggression, um, and you say, well, that's probably really not what they were saying, so just never mind. Psychological impact of having a microaggression and then having it invalidated and then ignored and then told to get over it, like all of those have an impact on the way a person can then start to view themselves, feel about themselves and the people they interact with. So all of that can lead to things like depression, lowered self-esteem, lower sense of self, um, and increased trauma stress reactions in a person or a collective people, if it happens enough. So what do you do when someone comes to you when they experience a microaggression? Or you're accused of, making a microaggression on a client or a coworker or someone. The first thing is to listen. <clears throat> it's so important to listen to how that person perceived and experienced their side. What are they feeling? What did they think? How did it make them feel? Listen. And then you want to validate their experience. And it even if it's not the same way you experienced it, the important part is that you validate for your client or your coworker or someone that their experiences are valid, their thoughts are valid, their feelings are valid. Because again, you don't wanna leave a person in this crazy making catch 22, did it really happen? Did it not happen? Am I overthinking this? Am I being oversensitive type of space? Because that, is what can lead to the self-doubt. That's what can lead to the lowered self-esteem, lowered sense of self, lowered um, ability to connect and, and, um, and create space for people. Um, don't try to explain what happened. You know, don't try to explain, well, maybe they didn't really mean that. Maybe that's not what they wanted to say or you're thinking it out of proportion you're blowing things out of proportion. You know, you want to listen, validate, and when it, when you can, advocate. Advocate for that person. Because you validating and listening and learning to advocate for a person can um, can make all the difference for them. It can make all the difference and it can leave space for um, for continued growth. So that's important. Okay. Um, so we've been talking about multiple things. We've talked about historical trauma. We talked about, um, regular outside of the pandemic ongoing stress stressors that can exist. Um, we talked about the ways that COVID-19 changed you know, workplaces, it changed um, schools for kids, it changed a lot for many communities. Um, and COVID-19, man, they, it really, really compounded all the stressors that, that exist. Many, many, fam many family members or community members started experiencing additional financial stressors, either by being furloughed, their loss of job, um, their job closures, um, or just loss of, of income altogether. Um, healthcare workers in, did, in tribal communities continued to work even harder and longer hours. Family members may, were still going through very difficult experiences with loss of financial stability and employment. Um, already emotionally compromised people who had health disparities and inadequate resources um, and infrastructure, they, they started to experience things like overcrowded housing and, you know, long geographic distances to travel for basic needs. You know, having access to food in, in a food desert is a real thing. Um, so tribal sovereignty and food sovereignty became really important throughout the pandemic. There were 
you know, the loss, the loss of a routine, you know, in general was really traumatic for some families. The loss of routine of going to school had had a trauma impact on kids. There was more isolation, even though you were surrounded by family all the time because you were in a, in, you know, some of the smaller tribal communities, they were on complete lockdown. You couldn't visit from house to house. So the people you lived with in your immediate household were who you were, who you were with 24 seven. So it created a new sense of isolation despite being surrounded by your family. Um, there were many missed milestones. There are missed milestones across the lifespan. There are missed milestones in missing a baby shower. There were missed milestones in, you know, celebrations, traditional celebrations, traditional gatherings. Um, there were, um, you know, adults and even elders missed their friends. I heard so many times how elders wanted to go back to the elder elderly program or the senior center, they missed their friends. It was the same for kids. Kids missed their friends. They missed that, that um, being able to connect with peers on the playground or in the classroom. And then there was significant loss in communities. There were, there were the loss of family members, elders, extended family members, and all of that compounded to emotional exhaustion, mental exhaustion, physical exhaustion, you know, and all of that. How does that impact our, our well-being, our, our mental health? Well, our, our irritability increases. We get sleep disturbances. There's a loss of morale. We're easily angered. We're not using, um, you know, the same coping mechanisms that we typically use. So these were all coming up um, in, in various ways. And there were implications to the ways that the outside world, non-AI, AN communities were responding to Native Americans. Like I brought up the hospital, you know, there's that dominant society view of how, um, how infected by COVID-19 communities were. And it made this, made a sense, it created the sense of distrust with medical professionals because women were going to these hospitals to have babies, yet their babies were taken away. So it, it activated this new sense of trauma. I wanna take a minute to look at what some trauma, what some trauma response features are, because we're talking a lot about all the stressors. Um, what kind of trauma responses do we see in the community? There was increased depression, there were PTSD symptoms, but more than that, there were things that occurred throughout the pandemic and they continue to be ongoing because the pandemic's not over. In many parts of the world, the pandemic is still very real. In you know, some communities, they are still trying to you know, get vaccinations. They're still trying to reach that herd immunity. Um, they're scared of opening communities back up right away because there's that fear of, of the community being impacted again after, after the trauma that you know, communities have experienced throughout the last 15, 16 months. Um, so one of the trauma, the historical trauma response features is that survivor's guilt. And we see this, especially in families that maybe where multiple family members were affected by COVID-19 and one didn't make it. So there's that sense of survivor guilt. Um, and we're seeing this in, in even young adults, in teenagers, in, in, yo in younger kids, um, because they're seeing all of this grief and this sickness around them, yet they're okay. They have that sense of survivor guilt. Why was it my aunt? Why was it my parent? Why was it so-and-so um, and not me, you know? Um, there's this hypervigilance. There's this hypervigilance about wanting to protect the community. You see it on a community level. You see it at individual levels, that hypervigilance of cleaning and sanitizing, resanitizing, you know, the mask wearing, the sanitizing your hands constantly. Um, 
and not, you know, the hyper vigilance of not opening the communities back up too soon to let, you know, outsiders come back in or visitors or, you know, travelers come back into the community to some, um, to some degree. There's this kind of psychic numbing, this, um, and, and I've heard it described also as pandemic fatigue, where people are just numb to what is happening. They're just going through the motions of the day because they're just trying to survive. Their stress levels have been activated to fight, fight, or freeze for so long that they're just numb. They're just numb to it, almost like I am done with this. Um, there's the fixation to trauma. They're, they're, that fixate, not in the sense that they're, they're stuck in it, but they replay it over and over. They go through it over and over again. You know, what could have gone, what could have gone differently? What could have gone, you know, what could have, should have, would have. All of those are happening. Um, somatic symptoms may be present. The presence of self-destructive behavior and suicidal ideation. Um, people might have compensatory fantasies. Um, others, have this fantasy of reunification with deceased, the deceased, or this feeling of like they cheated death or they escaped death. Um, there's the preoccupation with trauma, with death. There's a certain loyalty there. You know, we're seeing a certain loyalty to the deceased and internalization of ancestral suffering. That's a historical trauma response where they internalize the suffering and they carry that trauma inside them. Um, the vitality of um, in one's own life seen as betrayal to ancestors who suffered so much. So this sense of um, I, I see this sometimes in our in our younger clients that sense of why why should I be happy? You know how can I live a like a full life if so and so's life was cut so short? That's a historical trauma response. Um, so all of these here are historical trauma response features that we're seeing um, and, and they're popping up and I feel like I've seen an increase in it during the pandemic than I've seen at any other point in my career, um, these historical response features. So what do we do with all this? You know, in what do we do with all of this stress, all of this compounded stress and all these historical response features, how in the microaggressions that are happening, how do we help clients move forward? Well, just like we focus and we talk about historical trauma, we wanna redirect that energy to talking and focusing on historical resilience because it's important to remind our communities, our tribal leaders, our tribal elders, our kids, especially the youth in tribal communities that their individual and tribal resistance has survived over 500 years despite colonization, historical trauma, genocide. Their language is still there. Their culture is still there. Their, their traditions are still there despite everything that was put in the way to, to stop their, their culture and their traditions from you know, being a vital part of their life. So we think about the residential schools. They happened despite the residential schools. We have many communities who, who were grieving through, grieving not because, they, not because there was the loss of tradition, but because they couldn't freely practice their tradition like they do annually or on a, on a seasonal basis throughout the year. And I saw that many communities were trying to adapt despite the pandemic to still carry on their traditions and their cultural practices in the best way that they could. So historical resilience, the definition is the cumulative emotional and psychological resilience across generations, including the lifespan. So just like historical trauma talks about all the trauma that comes across the generations up until a second ago, so does its resilience. So does the resilience that our, that our tribal individuals and communities carry. It is generational, intergenerational, 
and it's fortified in our, it has been fortified in our communities across the pandemic. And you see it in so many examples. We see it in the tight-knit communities, the way that communities came together to respond. We see it in the way that tight-knit communities um, provided for their elders, you know, by, by um, food distributions, um, by, you know, I know one of the communities that I work with had food distributions, they had family game distributions so that families could re-engage with one another in a way that they had not been able to because they were always on the go, go, go. Um, there was, there's a high value on caring for families, elders, and children. There's this collective belief that we are responsible for more than just ourselves. We're responsible for our family. Therefore, we're responsible for our community. So that, you know, that feeds into the tight-knit communities, and that's what helps create this sense of resilience, this resilience that we have carried from generation to generation. And because we value each generation, it's being passed on, even even to the young kids, you know, they may not know what it is right now that they're being instilled with, but they, they are getting that sense of resilience and strength intergenerationally. Um, you know, even though throughout the pandemic, we couldn't, communities and, you know, tribal leaders couldn't always practice their traditional beliefs or traditional dances, prayers, ceremonies, there were ways that they were adapted. There were ways that they were still being honored and practiced. Um, so the cultural practices and the beliefs that we have in our communities, in our families, they, they become supportive. They create these smaller communities of people that we cling to. Um, and I know like in some, I know some people they'll, they'll uh, form groups and, and they'll have this group of, you know, men or, you know, a family, two families that travel together for ceremony or they do things together um, because it creates a new sense, a different sense of community. Um, and all of this, all of the ways that we used our historical resilience and protected the communities, you know, the, the road closures, the closure to outsiders, all of that was made, you know, that was allowed because we have tribal sovereignty. The tribe, the sovereign nation status for each of our communities gave us the, it allowed us to practice limitations in a way that others, non-tribal non communities couldn't really practice. Um, like Rio Rancho couldn't really close down. Like that would have been hard to close to outsiders. Um, but the Pueblos surrounding Rio Rancho could, they could close their roads and say, if you're not from this community, please don't visit because we don't want you to um, bring COVID into our community to impact our children, our families, or our elders. So that sovereignty was really important. And I think there was a really great story in, was it North Dakota or South Dakota that, that was just a really great illustration of how tribal sovereignty was used when the governor of the state tried to um, like veto or get rid of the closure um, and wanted access to tribal lands, but the tribe stood strong and said, no, we're a sovereign nation. We can in fact close, close down the roads. Um, you know, we saw people get creative throughout the pandemic. The social distance powwows that were online, there were online concerts, online prayers and church services. Traditional practices were being performed with only necessary people present. So instead of a big community event, it was only the necessary people who were showing up. Native traditions and practice that, practices that had survived a millennia and, um, were continued to be there as a support, as a, as a strength in many families, communities, even though they weren't practiced in the full way that we're used to seeing in our lifetime, it was still there. There was a refocus on traditional teachings through language, cultural practices, weaving, beading, language study, planting. Um, so how did this impact and transform the way we do treatment? Well, 
first, we had to switch to a whole new platform. We changed to telehealth services. And this, again, brought out its own challenges because some infrastructure was lacking. And in those cases, we changed just to telephone services to make sure clients were okay. We listened to the community. We listened to the community and we listened to what their needs were. We listened to partners of the community. We listened to school teachers, families, parents, clients. We listened to anyone who was willing to speak to us about what was needed in the community at this time. And through that, we changed our intervention strategies. We partnered with schools to come into the school while they were having live sessions. So we would log in. We all got like Google Classroom access that was granted by each of the principals of our, of our tribal schools. And we had Google Classroom platforms that we could actively log in and be with teachers, present DBT strategies to kids so that they were learning coping mechanisms as part of their daily learning. We partnered with frontline workers to provide needed support to avoid burnout and intervene with pandemic fatigue. We had client, we had partners who were on the front lines, and we made sure that those frontline workers had a wellness group. So we created support groups for frontline workers, and we adjusted to their schedules. We adjusted to their schedules to meet their needs. You know, our best resource was our community and we utilized every available resource, every available technology we could. We did a parent teacher, we did a parent coffee hour because parents needed the support and the validation that what they were doing through the pandemic, how they were parenting was not only valid, but it was a struggle. You know, there, there's this parenting guilt about um, facing the realization of how hard parenting can be outside of a global pandemic, it became even harder with the ongoing pandemic because now you weren't just mom or dad. You were mom, dad, the teacher, the PE teacher, the art teacher, you were the cook, you were the cleaning lady. You played all of these different roles in this isolated space of your home. Your home no longer became the place you went for, you know, unwinding and comfort and care and rejuvenation, but it became the school, it became work, it became the place the kids had recess. Um, you know, it, it became isolating and you couldn't cope in your home the, the way that you normally could. Now, because kids were missing out on a lot of social time, they weren't having lunch with their friends so they couldn't sit and gather and talk. They weren't having recess. Um, and if they were having a break from sit looking at the computer screen all day, they, they weren't getting the same kind of interaction they would if they were in school, like in classroom face-to-face -face school. So we listened and we created a social hour and we destigmatized the idea of, you know, being in a group setting, a therapeutic group setting, and we just called it a social hour. We had a structure to the social hour so that kids were learning coping mechanisms and we were pulling out the strengths of each of the kids. And, and how they were coping. Not only did this create a community of normalization for parents and kids, but they also got to hear ideas from one another of different ways to cope. And it normalized the idea across communities that, they, that everyone was going through this pandemic and everyone was having the same kind of struggles through the pandemic that they were. So it had this, this um, parents and kids had this reaction of, I'm not alone in this. My family isn't alone in this. The, the family next door is having the same issues that I'm having, or the family across town is having the same issues, or people across the river are having the same issues I am. So it created this community of nor, you know, normalizing the difficulties of the pandemic, and people gathered to hear coping strategies, coping mechanisms. So because there was so much success with the parent and the, the kids group, 
people started to bring their elderly parents because again, we were working with communities that had intergenerational homes. So then they started bringing their parents and it morphed into this intergenerational hour where when the elders would join, they would take on this teaching role and they would tell stories or they would tell jokes. Um, I think one night we even did like a bingo in their native language and, ki and, and kids got the opportunity, non-native speakers got the opportunity to hear the language. Not only that, but it was a learning opportunity for them. They didn't just get to hear it, but in order to partake and participate in the bingo, they they had to ask questions, ask elders, you know, what does this mean? And elders really stepped in to take that opportunity to use it as a teaching moment and really teach about the culture and the language and where, you know, a word or a phrase comes from. Um, so that def it, it turned into these cultural lessons. And then from there, it turned into like the elderly socialization hour. So what started as just listening to the community and what the community needed and, and hearing that they just, you know, they need some socialization outside of school or work or the things that they're doing. It turned into this multi-generational, culturally infused um, support network work for families to come to um, and because we broke it up you know we we tried to keep things separate so parents would have their group um, we had a social hour for the kids we had an intergenerational hour we kept them all separate because we wanted each group to have a focus and to feel supported um, but we also wanted to encourage the 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 family coming together, which is what the intergenerational hours really helped with. It took a lot of partnering with community organizations. It took a lot of partnering with other um, groups in the community that needed um, that needed contact hours for grants because a lot of the the tribes that the tribal community that we worked with. Um, relied on a lot of grant funding. So grant funding depends on what? It depends on contact hours. So we as clinicians needed our contact hours. They needed outreach. Psychologists are multi-dimensional in what they do. So we put on our psychology hats and we said, how can we tackle this? And what is gonna be our main focus? How are we gonna do this? How are we gonna organize this in such a way that they're meeting their grant needs we are you know helping people cope and survive this pandemic and and get through it how are we supporting the community that we care so much about in a way that is informative in a way that doesn't burn people out and in a way that we can engage and you know access engage and have access to a lot of families that really need this support so we came up with all these ideas and we decided that we weren't gonna focus on just mental health. We couldn't go into this just focusing on mental health because as indigenous people, I don't think we operate that way. I know that when we go to IHS, sometimes mental health is in, a, in behavioral health is in one building while you see your doctor in another building, but um, the social workers down the hall and maybe native practices in another building or something, you know, even though that's how Western society separates the, the whole person. I don't think that's the way we, we operate um, many times. And, and when we did various activities with kids and in families and elders and parents, we saw this mixing and overlapping that when people were taking care of their mental health, it wasn't just mental health, it overlapped with their spiritual health. It overlapped with their social health. It overlapped with their physical health. They were all embedded and, and they made up the whole person. They couldn't just separate one piece. So we, we decided to take the approach, how can we, how can we incorporate all these aspects when we're, when we're doing these socialization hours? What do we do and how do we help the community? So we identified what, how, what, how is this coming up? What does it look like when, when they're being physically affected, they're 
being mentally affected, spiritually affected, or socially affected. We saw isolating, withdrawing from family activities. Kids weren't coming to the dinner table to eat. They wanted to eat alone in their bedroom. Um, there were relationship conflicts. Uh, people were experiencing muscle tension, jumpiness, headaches. They were, you know, going to the doctor for things that they had never experienced before, digestive issues, digestive issues, <laughs> fatigue or insomnia. That was a real issue during the pandemic. And it, it's an ongoing issue. The worry and the anxiety about having to go to the grocery store, how am I going to feed my family if I lose my job or if I'm furloughed, the irritability that comes that that is impacted by the fatigue, the depression, difficulty concentrating and mood swings, the feeling of helplessness or hopelessness, especially kind of in the early months and kind of mid pandemic, like June, July-ish, August, when it just felt like there was gonna be no end to this. Like, when is this gonna end? There was that feeling of hopelessness. When, where's the light at the end of the tunnel? Spiritually, people were questioning why, why this, why now, why is this happening? Expressing some anger towards their higher power, their spiritual, um, their, their creator, their spiritual guider. So we wanted to impact the, the families, the people, the communities that we're working with address all of this and how. And access and tap into their resilience. So we talked a lot about self-care and coping, and we talked a lot about that historical resilience. And what came out was, you know, stressors might look different for everyone, but we all experience stressors in one way or another. We all, you know, when we're faced with stressors, we're, we all access that fight, flight, or freeze is all activated in all of us. And it's important to manage those stressors by tapping into what we can attune, attend to naturally. So one of the most, one of the things we focused on was skills that they could take away and that they could implement right away. Skills that were, that were easy, skills that were, that families across the generation could implement at any life stage um, and things that we knew that they didn't have to get a lot of additional, um, additional supplies or additional things for. So we looked at mindfulness, the practice of being present because dur throughout the pandemic and during the pandemic, what we would often hear is, well, this is how it used to be when this was not here. So there was a lot of talking about pre-pandemic. And then there was a lot of forward talking about when the pandemic is gone. But there wasn't a lot of focus about the here and now. What happens when we're not focused on the here and now? When we're thinking about what has already happened or ruminating on what's already happened or ruminating on what hasn't happened, we become anxious, we become worried, we become depressed because we're missing what isn't here now. So examples of some of the skills we would inter implement or intervene with or teach are the stop. You know, we, we taught a lot of acronyms, stop. Literally stop in the moment when you're being, when all these stressors are being activated, you feel like you're gonna fight, flight, fight, flight, or freeze. Just stop, literally stop what you're doing. Take a breath, observe. Observe what is around you now. Who is around you? What sounds do you hear? What do you see? What do you smell? Stop, take a breath and observe and pull back. And then think about what works for you. Another one of our favorites was halt. Stop and ask yourself, are you hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? And most likely you're one of those things. And if you are, what can you practice to soothe that part of you that, that, that has needs? If you're hungry, what, what do you have around you that you can eat? Go to the kitchen and make something. Maybe the rest of your family is also hungry. 
Are you angry? And if you are angry, what are you angry about? And how can you soothe that anger? If you're lonely, can you go and talk to your family member or your grandparent or an aunt? Can you phone, can you call somebody? Um, we taught them the five fingered breathing strategy, you know, learning how to take deep breaths, you know, taking deep breaths to activate the part of their brain that helps them relax because it is that deep breathing exercise that helps to relax, you know, put, release the tension and activates the relaxation in your brain. So, look, so teaching them the five finger breathing exercises, you know, breathe in, slowly breathe out, breathe in, hold your breath, breathe out. And, you know, teaching them to practice that. The other one that we did was the, the, we call it the five, four, three, two, one. Again, activating all of your senses, very simple. They can do it anywhere. They can do it while they're driving. They can do it while they're walking, but activating all five of the senses by what are five things you can see? What are four things you can touch? What are four, three things you can hear? What are two things you can smell? And what is something you can taste? So teaching them things that they could take away and utilize and implement right away was important because it gave them a tool to walk away with. They weren't leaving empty handed without a new skill, without a new tool, but they were taking something with them after every session to practice. And this became a family practice. The families would practice each of these things. Um, so it was a way to help people um, take a break from the chaos of, you know, everything that was going on in the home and in the world and focus on the here and now and help release some of those relaxation, um, you know, help the brain relax, help the families relax a little bit. We encourage them to do it once or twice a day and to be each other's advocates and each other's buddies to remind each other to do some of these things. And I loved how some of the teachers that we were in classes with implemented these, these strategies into the classroom. So when, it, when they notice a, a student wasn't turning in their work or something, it was time to engage them with, you know, some kind of mindfulness or, or starting class with mindfulness and ending class with mindfulness. And this became an important strategy for, for students. Um, so thinking about strategies to use, we wanted to make sure, again, that we're attending to all, all slices, all pieces of the whole. We wanted to make sure that people's mental, physical, social, and spiritual health was being attended to. And we would do exercises with them. Like, what are you doing to, what are you doing for yourself this week? And sometimes people would say, well, I'm exercising. I'm exercising, I'm walking. But a lot of times it didn't fall nicely. Like I'm only walking for my physical self. A lot of people said I'm walking and that helps me take care of my physical and my mental, my mental self. Um, I go, you know, I go gardening and that helps me reconnect to my higher power. It helps me remember that there's something greater than myself. So even though gardening or planting was something physical and strenuous, it helped them spiritually. So there were many examples across families and across the community in ways that, you know, making these connections didn't just take care of one aspect, but it overlapped in all the areas. And in each of the areas, people had examples of how they overlapped and how it helped them feel better. And that's important. It was important to really pay attention to how individuals saw themselves as not being four parts, but one whole person with, with overlapping layers. And a blank slide for your entertainment. Um, our, the kids that we worked with loved to laugh and we learned throughout throughout the last you know these last 16 months that laughter is medicine laughter is medicine for families for kids and we have some really talented community members and 
there was one community partner that reached out to us at UNM and said, hey, can you help us find like a comedian to come and do like a Zoom show or do a comedy show? We'll pay them. And we thought, well, why don't you tap into the 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 talent and resource in your own community make it a competition among the kids maybe you can get the fifth graders to do a comedy show and it can be a competition they can do a comedy you know do a cartoon strip like you're seeing on the screen now and you know use some of the grant money as rewards or incentives and that's a way that they could still um access grant funds and meet grant um you know grant objectives um but being creative with it in different ways or you know some kids would want to start the class with laughter and start with a joke and end with a joke um or they would always um you know want to start with a song or end with a song many of our groups either they had they began this routine. We saw this routine and this theme coming up where they wanted to start and end in a certain way. And across the groups, it was all different. You know, our younger group of kids, like the kindergartners, they always wanted to dance it out. So at the end of every session, we would play a fun kid song and we would all get up and dance. And it was a way for the community to connect with each other, to laugh, to have fun, to have some kind of lighthearted, spirited fun with each other, despite all of the things that were happening. It was a stress reliever for many. So it, it became it became um, a pattern across the groups we were working with that they started a certain way and they ended a certain way. And that's the one thing we kept consistent. Everything that happened in the middle part of the meeting or in the middle part of our social hour was often whatever, you know, however the whatever needed to be addressed that day, however parents felt, however kids were feeling, and we'd address and, and validate what was happening now. And then teach a skill and then end in some fun, creative way. Because of historical trauma and, and some of the trauma that is related to healthcare settings, we also wanted to redirect the message that safety was ceremony. We wanted to talk about safety in a way that was consistent with resilience and consistent with you know wanting to protect the community and our elders and our children so we talked about safety as a method of ceremony by being safe by you know wearing our face masks and wearing you know getting vaccinated those were safety measures to keep our community safe in addition we also highlighted the the ways that indigenous or American Indians were in positions of power, you know, being, being part of the conversation, being part of the COVID task force, that, you know, that because of the trauma, not just because of the trauma, but because of the resilience, because of the historical resilience, that resilience paved the way for some of our tribal members to become educated, to be put into these positions of influence and power, to have a voice and to have a say in how safety is performed in our tribal communities. And that was an important part for us to highlight because we wanted our community members to understand that that their best that their best interest their well-being and their health was our highest priority and talking about safety and normalizing safety safety measures became a, a, nor, a thing that we did normal in every session um, we would start a session with a face mask to encourage the kids to wear face masks when they were outside of their home um, we had a therapist who always had a gingerbread person in the background with the face mask that was drawn on. So there were different ways that we utilize the messaging of safety is ceremony.
we really encourage people to continue to think about their circle of support and how they could access that circle of support even through the pandemic. And we would often do this in various ways. One example for kids was we did a scavenger hunt We'd ask kids, go help, go, you know, go find something that helps you connect to your grandparents who might not be in the home. And it was really great to watch kids go off and bring back like a telephone, like a girl brought her or it, we didn't ask her what what helps you connect to your grandparent. We asked her um, what helps you cope. What has helped you cope in the last week? And she ran off and she happened to come back with a phone. A lot of kids came back with their iPhones or iPads. And when we asked them, like we did the show and tell portion of it, they all said, it helps me see my grandma or it helps me see my auntie. It helps me connect with family that I'm not living with or that is not in the home. And that was so important. We highlighted how that's a coping mechanism and how they were accessing their circle of support, how they were continuing to cultivate those those um, those people who help them be strong and cope better throughout the pandemic. So it was, even though the pandemic made people feel a little more isolated in the world, we helped them think of this circle of support as a way of how do we reach out? How do we access one another despite the restrictions that are in place? How do we access our support systems despite um, the restrictions and the limitations on visiting and things like that. How do we do this um, and support each other and create those circles of support for one another? We wanted to always, always highlight it help people keep in mind that traditional spiritual and religious practices and beliefs help us sustain our resilience. Because our traditional ways are embedded in who we are and where we come from, it's embedded in the land that we, that we call home, it's important that we access those. You know, we encourage them to take pause and show gratitude throughout the day. And I know that this was difficult for some, some family members who lived off of tribal lands and could not come home. That isolation was real. And creating that support network for them to feel part of home, to feel closer to home, even if they weren't able to go home, was really important. We needed to create that that system and that support network for individuals. We wanted them to know that they still had a space in their tribal community, in their families, and that, you know, that, that sense of hope and the sense of resilience that they get from their people, from their homelands, that it would still be there when, they're, when things opened up again and they were able to go home again. Um, I know that for many people this last year was difficult. So the way that we, um, the way that we tried to be creative and tried to access and utilize the resources that we had to provide mental health services, health care for clients, for families, for the community as a whole and support them through the pandemic, we had to really get creative. And there was a time where we just brainstormed everything and we, we, we tried, we failed many times. Some things didn't work as well, but once we found something that worked with one group, we piloted it with another group. And then we expanded those programs that really worked and helped people connect to the idea of resilience and strength building. Throughout the year, we've seen so much of that fortified in the communities. We've seen gardens come up. We've seen you know, little girls and boys learn how to bake, how to cook, how to weave, how to bead, engage with their language, um, relearn parts of their language. We've had Pictionary games online um, in Karis, in Navajo, in, in multiple languages, so that individuals could reconnect with the language and hear it and be, be strong because they're hearing their language 
Um, we've seen elders connect over Zoom. I never thought I'd see the day when elders were connecting over a social Zoom and having bingo over, over the Zoom platform. Um, we saw intergenerational connections as little kids taught their grandparents how to use the computer. I, you know, one grandparent was jokingly calling, jokingly called her grandkids her IT department because they knew how to work the phones, they knew how to work the computers better than she did. And whenever she encountered a problem, they helped her solve it. They helped her troubleshoot and helped her fix her phone. Um, helped her fix her computer and she was able to use it from there. So um, really there was there was a lot of creativity, a lot of trial and error, and a lot of learning this past year in how to connect and how to support wellness and mental health throughout the pandemic for, for the communities. Um, so it was... It, it was it was a lot. There was a lot going on. So that is actually the last of my slides. I don't know how much more time I have left. You actually perfectly ended it at ten minutes. Oh, great! <laughs> perfect. I timed that perfectly. Okay. So I guess from here, we'll just open it up for questions. I do want to say a special thank you and acknowledgement to Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, Jennifer Nanez, and Jeremiah Simmons, all who have contributed to the presentation with their expertise, knowledge, and experience. We've all given you know, this slide um, presentation, various forms of it in multiple ways. Um, and they've worked really hard with me throughout the year to make sure that we're providing adequate services to all of our clients. So I just want to acknowledge them verbally. They're not able to be here. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll go ahead and take a few questions. Perfect. And you all can unmute yourself to ask your question or you can type it into the chat box and we can read it for you. Also, last spiel about CE credits before you all jump off, um, while we also wait for questions. Um, I said this at the beginning, but if you are seeking CE credits, um, please be sure to click that sign out, link, sign out link on the invitation email that you received. We do need that timestamp for you to be able to receive those. ASU is processing those CE credits for us um, for the session, and they let me know that it'll take about three weeks for that information to get back to you, so you can plan in about three weeks. Hello. Oh, and then Deidre. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I just want to ask a question. Um, this historical tra uh, trauma stuff. Um, we have a lot of um, um, racial intermarriage, and we have a lot of uh, kids, grandkids, cousins that are. Um, um, I'll, I'll say half Anglo, and it seems like this, um, this whole um, thing is kind of targeted towards um, Anglos. And we have a lot of kids that are half. And, um, and how do we, uh, if we're um, trying to get over um, these historical tra traumas, and we kind of, um, have this tone that um, the white people cause all this on us. How do we, it seems like we're, going, we're, we're just gonna make some of our own children, some of our own people feel, feel the trauma again, um, um, putting these, um, <clears throat> putting these um, um, bad um, thoughts and, um, and, and instigating, like you were saying, um, microaggression, like sneaking things in there. If we do that to them, I mean, uh, it seems like we're gonna be um, the cause of um, putting trauma on some of our own people that are mixed, that are half Anglo. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, um, that's a, 
that's something that needs to be um, 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 talked about too. That uh, that's what because I have cousins that are half, and they kind of feel feel like the um, the, the the community is going to be um, singling them out and stuff like that. So. Um, and we're just going to be the, um, the problem to, to these, um, to, to these um, our people that are half Anglo. Um, so um, that's what I wanted to say. And that's kind of what I'm, I'm kind of um, um, worried about. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Dolly. Um, I think it is a it, an important clarification to make that historical trauma isn't targeted at one, like a single group of people. It, it, historical trauma, the definition in itself is not the trauma that one group causes onto another group. It is your, a person's historical trauma. So individuals who might be from two different, who might come from two different, two different races, you know, like you said, half white, half Navajo or half American Indian, they come with their own collective historical trauma. And, you know, it's important to pay attention that they have a background and a story too, and it helps them. It creates a space where they see themselves, how they interact with their family, how they have relationships, and it impacts the way that they feel they are seen, how they how they see themselves. Um, so historical trauma isn't there to create a problem. It's to acknowledge that there were that there was trauma and there is atrocities that individuals have had to live through and collectively individually some of those trauma responses can be impacted by events that you see on the news they can be impacted by the things that you hear like microaggressions so i just want to be clear that historical trauma does not mean or is not there to instigate or create a problem between multiple races or groups of people. It's there to acknowledge the trauma that has existed and that has been there. Uh, so thank well, you for your I contribution. Heard, uh, yes, I heard the word, uh, the dominant society. And who, who is that dominant society? Um, I might have said Western, Western frameworks, um, dominant society. Um, often when I speak of dominant society, it is the dominant framework that we work within in any context. It can be the medical context. It can be the academic context. There is a dominant society that has decided, you know, what, what system of school we're going to use, what medical practices will we we are going to use what behavioral health practices are going to be deemed evidence based and when and in a lot of times those don't come from indigenous voices or native american voices but now like i said earlier because of the historical resilience there's now a pathway for individuals like myself for your cousins for my kids for generations to come to attain access to education to have a voice in those systems. Hey Deidre, so the other yes. um, most asked question besides the PowerPoint slides, if those will be available, but the next question was for your contact information. If you, if you want to provide that, you can. Okay. Uh, um, but that's what's being asked right now. I will put my email information into the chat. Perfect. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one. Um, so I can give like couple seconds if anybody has that last question. When you spoke of microaggressions, it brought to mind the term critical race theory, which was on the news last night where parents in wealthy, mostly white community were physically acting out because they believed their school district was going to teach about historical aspects of slavery 
it reminded me that most schools don't teach about genocide of American Indians and American Alaskan Natives. You know, that's a really great point, Tammy. Yes, um, critical race theory has been in the news a lot lately. Um, critical race theory is a theory that examines the way that race impacts different systems like the justice system, social systems, housing systems. It examines how infrastructures use race to segregate and um, suppress um, people who are not in a position of power. And a lot of times people, you know, based on critical race theory, things like slavery or Japanese internment camps or the genocide on American Indians and Native American or Alaskan Natives are not talked about in school because the, the idea of critical race theory is the people who are in power, the people who make the books, who write the books, are the ones who get to decide what goes into the books. And again, because of I want to stress with historical resilience, there is now a, a pathway that has been paved for American Indians to access spaces of education that would have not been available to them previously to turn to to use education as a tool, a tool to inform and educate about the history of our people and have a voice in how we change academic systems, how we, how we culturally inform medicine, how we culturally inform behavioral health care, how we culturally inform the systems of education so that our children are benefiting from them in the best way possible. So I think you bring up an excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up, Tammy. Hi, Deidre, just really quick, just to what you and Tam are, you know, re responding to Tammy's comment, I really like that idea because I think it's a segue down what I had put in the comment box of the transactional model uh, of stress and coping. And that's something that's most predominantly used um, in the realm of individuals that aren't really have lacked the credentialing to actually, you know, do that one-on-health one on uh, psychotherapy of analyses that are all actually involved at the clinical base level. And I think that's um, just really quick, you know, the pandemic has illuminated the health uh, inequities and inequalities of um, negatively impact by, uh, impacting racial, you know, and ethnic minorities, so especially American Indians and Alaska Native communities. This continuing pattern, you know, of health disparity leads to uh, leads itself to a lower life expectancy among Native communities alike, um, compromised by inadequate education, disproportionate poverty, uh, discrimination in health of deli or delivery of health services, and cultural differences. You know, they stem from historically imposed socioeconomical adversities, and as you highlighted, a lot of those. And that's always great to hear that you know some people. And I feel great knowing that I'm not the only one that's seen these and I, I identifying also a total lack of infrastructure, as you mentioned, you know, people being very resourceful by doing telehealth. So some people say we can't do telehealth because they don't have a laptop and or access to internet. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll try telephones and they do have cell phones. So it's stuff of that sort of being resourceful in that aspect in that manner as well, it really does help. But going back to the transactional model stress, you know, that, that framework that I was talking about, that um, the perception of that or cognitive appraisal of a stressful encounter determines, you know, how well one will cope with that stressor. As you mentioned, you know, there's very stressors, uh, various stressors out there, job loss, um, inadequate um, access to resources or inability access resources and stuff of that sort. So thank you very much, Deidre. This, is, this work is very, um, very dear, near and dear to me, as well as other individuals on the con. We do really appreciate your assistance. Um, so I think you're my nolly by clan, but <laughs> I'll just go ahead and leave it at that. Thank you very much, Deidre. Great work. Well, thank you so much, Lyle. It is important, and I'm so glad we're having this these conversations. Oh, I'm hearing. Um, and I think the other thing too, that critical race theory is, is again, just a theory. It's not a way of life. It's a way for us to conceptualize and understand the way things are and how they impact a group of people. The next step beyond critical race theory is what happens transactionally. Um, you know, sometimes we think of diversity, race, and bias training as something that we mark off, right, annually. Like, yep, I did that training. So it's tran very transact, like, um, 
yeah, transactional, but it's not transformative. The next step beyond that is to be transformative. What am I going to do with this information and how am I going to make it, you know, change, impact change so that education, healthcare, um, access to food, clean water, housing, all of those things become equitable. How do we change it so it becomes equitable? But before you can change it, you have to understand why it is there. And that's what critical race theory helps with. Are we out of time, Kelsey? We are actually, uh, but if you would like to take one more, there's nothing that is stopping us from somebody who has like a pressing question or if you'd like to take another question. Okay. But the session technically ended like four minutes ago. So up to you. And then again, my last spiel about CEUs. Uh, if you are seeking CEUs, please revisit that email that you got that brought you here to the session and click the little sign out um, link on that page for the session. And it takes two seconds to fill out uh, basically the session that you attended, which is this one. It's, what was the title of your session again? Uh, Emotional Wellbeing for AIAN in the COVID-19 crisis. Um, the timestamp, it'll ask you for a little signature uh, and then you're good to go. If you didn't do that for the previous session and you attended the previous session, please do that as well. Um, we can still take that. And with that, I think we're good. It was a really, really good presentation, Deidre. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for spending part of your day with me for sharing your time with me, for allowing me to, um, to just spend you know, 90 minutes with you. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. And um, thank you so very much. Thank you, Kelsey, for all of your help. Yep, yep. Thank you all. And I will um, end this meeting. But also, again, you can find that sign out session, the sign out link on your invitation email to the learning event. I'll see you all later. Thank you.